not Nancy Darga. <laughs> Nancy Watkins Darga. The bottom line is we went to school together. And we're still talking to each other. We went to high school together. Lost track of one each other with each other for a long time. And I was at a conference and all of a sudden this very familiar voice said, Lorraine? And I'm, Nancy. Nancy Darby is quite a professional. She is a landscape architect. She's received the Swanson Award. Uh, she has done distinguished service in landscape architecture and historic preservation throughout the metro area. Uh, she is the outgoing uh, director of the Automotive Heritage Center and tomorrow picks up her work at the Paquette plant and knowing Nancy, if she's pushing the envelope, that Paquette plant will be known within five years as a cultural resource that you can't beat and that you really need to visit in Detroit. I think she is passionate about um, the heritage of this region. She's passionate about automotive heritage, and she's really um, tied into making cool places where people gather. So would you please help me welcome my friend, Nancy Darker. Great. So Lorraine, do you have a clicker rooski, or what do I have to do? Um, Yeah, I don't do well standing still. Oh. Let's see if we can center this. So while she's fixing that, I want to ask, uh, why, well, ask you, why would a nice girl like me be talking about automobiles? <laughs> and uh, what I want you to know is that I was born and raised in Detroit. And as a result, I knew absolutely nothing about Detroit. And uh, because I'm a registered landscape architect, my life dream was to uh, work for Disney World and actually build theme parks. I got my opportunity when I got laid off by Wayne County, and I went to uh, Tokyo Disneyland, and I worked there. And that's when I found out about the most fascinating place on the globe. And I found it out by going to embassy parties. I lived in the Finnish embassy. And what happens is when you get invited to embassy parties, the polite thing to do in Japan is say where you're from and what your name is. So I would be Detroit Nancy-san. That was my tagline. Now, I go to these parties, and there's some really important people there. I mean, like the president of the Ohio uh, Railroad Company, which actually paid for the construction and the design of the Tokyo Disneyland, the president of... of uh, Maple, which is the design arm of Disneyland and all that. And yet, when I was there, what would happen is when you, you stand in a line and you introduce yourself and you bow, the Japanese are very polite and they would stand there like this and they'll smile, that really nice smile. And then all of a sudden I would say, I'm from Detroit, and they'd get all animated and they'd follow me around the whole rest of the night and it was so embarrassing. And they'd ask me questions about Detroit. And then I'd say to myself, why are they asking me questions about Detroit? And then I started, I had this aha moment. The reason they asked me questions about Detroit is because Detroit really had a global impact in the way we manufacture and in the way that we do business and in the way we actually interact in the economic markets. So, what happened is I realized I couldn't see the forest for the trees. Because I grew up in Detroit, I really didn't understand the significance of Detroit. And that was a really aha moment for me. So what happened is when I left, there was these village industry plants all along the river in Heinz Park. Oh, thank you, thank you. It's close enough, I think, Lorraine. Um, there was these little industry plants that were slated for demolition. Now, I don't know if you know anything about a uh, village industry plant that was uh, created by Mr. Ford, but here's what I discovered. We are in an area that it took me nine and a half years with a group of other, area, uh, other community activists to get dedicated as the Motor City's National Heritage Area. We are in part an affiliate of the national parks. 
there was a group of us that was concerned about how much of our heritage was slated for demolition. It seemed like they were very much like me before I went to Japan. They didn't understand the significance of our accomplishments to the auto industry. So I started this big campaign. I was going to save these village industry plants. And guess what? Nobody cared. The other thing is Ford Motor cared the less because it was a big liability to them. They just wanted to tear these things down. And so what happened is we forgot something. We have a unique distinction in this area, Motor City's National Heritage Area. Our thinkers and our tinkers become titans. And Henry's not the only one. We're going to talk mostly about him today because it's the 150th birthday coming up. But Packard's 150th birthday is also coming up. And we have all kinds of tinkers. We've got Mr. Sloan. And we got Mr. Durant, who ended up starting a small company called General Motors. Anybody heard of it? OK. Then we got Cousins, and we have these other things. And they created a company called Chrysler. But they did much more than actually create companies. What they did is they changed the way we move in the world. They gave us mobility. They took us out of the mud. They put the world on wheels. They helped fly man to the moon. That wasn't NASA, by the way. That tended to be Chrysler. They made the, boost, the Saturn rocket. The reason we could get through the atmospheric pressure without incinerating ourselves is because Ford created the hydraulics and the refrigeration that allowed us to get through that kind of heat. And then General Motors allowed Mr. Armstrong to drive around on the moon in a buggy, a lunar buggy, and no gravity. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty significant feat. And it's much bigger and much more global than just an engine with a V block and an exhaust. Do you get the significance of the change that came in the world out of the research and the development of the auto industry? And what's really interesting is it happened in our backyard. That's what really blows me away. You can, you can drive down the street and see where some earth-changing experiment became a, a uh, patent, and we're now just take it for granted, these things. How many of you ever heard of the burp valve that's in the artificial heart? How many of you knew that General Motors was the one that actually invented it and it actually produced the first artificial heart? How many of you go to a movie? How many do you know that the Dodge Brothers actually made this, the first synchronized film so that they could actually see what a crash looked like in motion and which eventually came to the reel-to-reel -reel camera? How many of you actually use a Garmin or a Tomahawk to find your directions? Where did that come from, that aerial view stuff? And how many of you are here today because your parents survived World War II? That is another part of the story that we can attribute it to greatly, and yet we don't celebrate it very much in Detroit. I see all these big parades, you know, going on on TV and everything, and I always think, yeah, where would you guys be? You'd be still holding a stick in your hand um, if it wasn't for some of the armament that got produced in here. So what Motor Cities is actually, uh, the reason why we got Motor Cities going, this group of activists, is we wanted people to actually reinvest in our historic sites. So we started out as a pre preservationist group. And what happened was there was a guy called Don Worling who was the executive director of the Henry Ford Fairlane Estate. Have anybody been there? Very pretty place. Um, but it's even more than pretty. It's where Jens Jensen introduced na naturescaping in America. It, it is where Thomas Edison made the first functioning hydro um, conversion of, of hydropower into electricity uh, in his um, powerhouse there at Fairlane. It is the first of many things. People just think it's a house, but it's not. In fact, almost every story you come into in Detroit, you'll find out there's a lot more to it than you thought in the story. But what happened is not only were we concerned about the rate these things were being torn down, we were really thought that they could be the catalyst for redevelopment in our area. And they have proven true to be so. Motor Cities is an um, affiliate of the national parks. And we are 
um, approved, legislated by Congress, and what we're supposed to do is tell, interpret the American story as it relates to both labor and automobiles, and so we preserve, promote our history, we actually create educational programs that inspire our youth to protect their legacy, and we also create and promote unique auto events that actually get people to reinvest into our communities. And one of the first projects, and I think that's why they asked me to be the executive, their first executive director, was the Paquette plant. So I get called up by Jerry Mitchell. He says, come on, we want to buy this building. So I go down, and this is the most derelict, one of the most derelict areas in Detroit. And I was afraid to get out of my car. So anyways, I get out of my car, there's this boarded up old yucky building and there's an illegal dump and I see that there's a drug drop going on in the building across the street. So he said, yep, Jerry, this is just prime real estate. Now you wanna buy this building, why? And he says, because this is where the Model T was invented and produced, it's the first Ford factory and it's called the Paquette plant. And this is where the concepts of mass production actually got started. So I said, that's great, why don't you ask Ford to buy it? They don't want it, they just wanna tear it down, we wanna buy it. So the Henry Ford Heritage Association buys this building and they join in partnership with Motor City's heritage area and we help them uh, garner federal grants because they're not qualified for it, but we are. So we ended up uh, partnering on the project. And so this is what we, this is actually pretty cleaned up. This is what we started with and that's what it's gone to. Now we've put about $802,000 in that project and you say, ah, $802,000. But let me tell you what's coming out of the project. First of all, we got the recreation department to get rid of their illegal dump. Shame on them. Took me a few phone calls, but we did get them to do it. They started doing it when they saw us fixing the building. Are you getting the drift of this? Okay. Then the drug drop across the street, we went to the Milwaukee Junction folks and said, you know what, you got some criminal activity here. And we couldn't get them to clean it up, but the fact that we kept bringing people there kind of did it for us because they don't like to make drug drops when you have a lot of people there. And so they kind of disappeared. We ended up, there was a fire at the Studebaker plant right down the street, and what ended up happening is the absentee landlord that owns the building next to us uh, got a million dollar settlement and we uh, forced her to fix her building up, which she did. And by the uh, result of that, she actually rented it out by 100%. I can tell you that the VA ended up tearing down a block and they put in, I think something like $11 million project where there's retail on the floor and there's apartments for uh, recouping um, veterans on the upper floor. There was a housing project that went in that $60 million around the corner. And then in addition to that, we have two factories that have been totally renovated and are being utilized again. Milwaukee Junction is the Sun Valley of the turn of the century, Silicon Valley of the turn of the century. It's where all the inventions were going on. It's where multi-many uh, car companies and it's where a lot of experimentation and research was going on. So if you could add up those numbers, you start seeing the ripple effects of actually preserving your history there. Not to mention it's just cool in there and you all gotta come and visit us and, you know, and, and bring your friends because it's just cool, I'm telling you, right now it is. Otherwise I wouldn't be going there. And then what happened is we don't just fix that building, we partner with other agencies. You want to go to the next one? <clears throat> and here's another project. That's my office in the corner there. This is uh, my introduction to the mills when I worked for Wayne County Parks. They sent me, I had this really nice air-conditioned building in downtown Detroit, and they sent me out here. And uh, they didn't tell me there was no water, no electricity. There was animal droppings all over the floor. And there was two nails stuck in the window. When I pulled the two nails out, the whole window casing fell down onto the bushes below. And I stood there holding the two nails, wondering what I had done in my previous life to be sent here. So anyways, I had to get some help to get the window back in there. And uh, eventually, I, I negotiated a deal to use the toilet down in the fire station a block away. And, um, and eventually, I said, what is this building? And that's how I found out about Henry Ford buying old grist mills and turning them into little engine plants uh, so that they could decentralize manufacturing. And that was uh, an eye-waking thing. And so when I went to Japan and realized all of these mills were slated for demolition, that kind of woke me up. 
It just woke me up that there's a huge story here. In fact, what, you know, that's where Thomas Edison actually met Henry all the time, especially when they were always avoiding debt collectors. That was another part of the story that I wasn't aware of. And ultimately, we raised $1.333 million for that building. And I don't say Motor Cities raised it. All these projects is a collaboration of people, and that's what we're about, is bringing people together. So what happened is I get a 16-year-old girl named Jennifer Spear. She comes in there. She says to me, I want to reopen this building that used to be a nature center. I said, that's really nice. I said, I need at least $2 million just to fix the roof and get the windows stabilized. She says, OK, let's start now. And I said, oh, OK, here, here's a buck out of my pocket. She says, no, I'm going to have a wine and cheese party. I said, OK, that's great. How old are you? 16. I'm from Churchill High School. I said, you can't ask for donations of wine and cheese. Oh, yeah, I can. My dad's a chief of police. I go, OK, great. So the 16-year-old girl, she has a wine and cheese party. We make $4,200, and she's ecstatic. Now, she has a wine and cheese party, but she gets the mayor to come. She gets the state rep to come. She gets all the, the, the tea clubs and the red hat ladies to come and all that stuff. So the, the mayor is really impressed with this high school school. He takes the $4,200. He goes out, and the next thing you know, we got a grant, and we got $8,400. So then the, the, the director of economic development takes $8,400. He goes out, and the next thing we know, we got $16,000. $800, and this goes on and on and on, and two years later we have $1.3 million, and we start the renovation project. That's the project started. That's the project as it is now. It's, one, it's considered one of the best nature centers in the metro area, and it's in the authentic Ford Village industry plant. Every mode of energy is exhibited in that area except for nuclear. It started with water power, it went to steam power, from steam power it went to combustion power, and so kids can learn all about it and yet they can actually make electricity themselves and light up some light bulbs. <clears throat> now, buildings aren't the only things that Motor Cities realized that we were, were in danger. When I was at the county, I got a call about quarter to midnight and the, the county photographer told me that the road commission, which is one of the first road commissions in America, had thrown out all of the historic archives into the dumpster in Bagley Avenue in downtown Detroit. So I said, oh, no. And he was hysterical on the phone. He says, Nancy, I tried to stop. So here I am, a young girl. I'm driving my dad's car downtown Detroit, and I'm climbing into a dumpster to get these historic photos. So we get the photos, the guy coffee grinds, it takes us two years to actually get them all dried out. We accession them, we get them back to the county. Was that stupid? Because guess what happened? Two years ago, we found out that they were in a flooding basement and they were actually getting covered with mold and everything. So Motor Cities intercepted and we started a campaign to have these photographs turned over to the state of Michigan. But here's the problem. The current administration in Wayne County didn't like who was the governor at the time. And they didn't want to give their historic artifacts to the state archives because they didn't want the governor to look good by saving these archives. And so do you get the gist of this? And Motor Cities is in the middle. So I just had, we had to literally, it took us 18 months of constant going back to them. See, we let them know we weren't going away. That this was so significant and important. The first traffic light the first mile of concrete, the first snow plow, the first divided freeway, the first white line. Those stories, it's the first, the first, the first, and nobody else in the world can tell that story but us. And we were throwing it in the dumpster. And I am sure that this is not the only organization that was doing it, because Chrysler was throwing out their archive, but I'm not going to tell you about the Chrysler story. Other than we did have some midnight marauders there, too. I just wasn't one of them. <laughs> the bottom line is we need to let our elected officials know that our story is so important, so impelling, that every effort must be made at all levels, be it the street activist, be it the elected official, be it the mayor, be it the little 16-year-old girl having a wine and cheese party, that we pool all of our resources to preserve our history and to actually instill a sense of reinvestment in it. Here we go. Now, we have really impelling buildings. 
We have really impelling historic photos and artifacts and all that good things. But we have some of the most amazing authors. Some authors spend 20 years of their life just researching a particular subject that's important to us. But you know what? Their books are not going to be on the New York Times bestseller list. I mean, only so many people are interested in the invention of the wiper blade. However, that's our legacy. We, there's no other way to pass that information on without supporting these authors. So that's one of the programs that we do. And believe me, it's one of the most misunderstood programs we do because most people who are not car guys could care less about these subjects. But yet, I'll tell you what, Jay Leno calls us up and he says, I bought a blah, 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 blah. He says, do you have anybody who's got a manual on that book? Or do you know why they did this or that? So he has what's called the big dog garage, right? And he's got these guys that work it. And we tell him, oh, yeah, we've got a whole library. we got some manuals for this. We can tell you how to do that. We can tell you that. Oh, my God. He was like ecstatic. His men were in the garage are ecstatic. Nowhere. Now, this guy can afford to go anywhere in the world to get information. But guess what? Only people who took the time to preserve it and believe it, it wasn't the car companies. It was these guys who knew that these inventions that happened needed to be documented and needed to be put in the story form. And so we're very grateful to them. One of the things we also do is we do lunch and learns in order to, to train people like this organization, this historical society, how to set up 501c3s and all that. Okay. Yep. Now, another thing we do is one of the most undocumented and uncelebrated contribution of a group to the auto industry is the African American. So we got a, we got a grant and we, we partnered up with the Charles Wright Museum. We created a website called Making Tracks. And it's basically so that African American, specifically young men, can go into this website and be inspired. Now this is how it works. We could have put a lot of facts and figures in there and who, what kid is going to sit there and read that, right? when they can go play on their, you know, MP3s and stuff and, and do this game. So what we did is we made little mini movies about these guys who really actually were the first, who broke the ceilings, who did that. So when you go to the website, and I, and I, I invite you to do so, Making Tracks, and what you do is you go in there and it has pictures of these guys, you click on it and their life story comes up. Now when I, I we tested this out on a school in Detroit, and uh, now we brought in, uh, uh, at the right, we brought in, I think, 20 computers, and we all sent them down. And we said, and I interviewed at least five of the kids and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? One wanted to be a football player, one wanted to be a basketball player, one wanted to leave the country and work for a big corporation and be a lawyer, and the other one wanted, uh, wanted to be just rich and famous. That's what he said to me. But anyway, so we start this thing, and we go through it. And after we interviewed him afterward, what happened was these young men stood up and said, I want to own my own business, like Mr. Davis did when he opened the first black-owned dealership. The other one said, well, I still want to work for a big corporation, but what I really would like to do is be the president of it. Do you see what happened? And just that hour and a half of them dealing with them, they started thinking differently about what's possible in the world. And we're very proud of that site. <clears throat> The other thing we launched in partnership with American Society of Body Engineers, one of the things we're really scared about is the high schools do not teach drafting anymore. The high schools do not have shop class anymore. The high schools do not do mechanic classes anymore because of the way the budget is, because of what the MEEP and what are the GLICs required. They got all these little letters on the road, and I get very dizzy and confused when they explain all the requirements of the school district. What I know is not every kid in school wants to be a doctor and lawyer and go to college. There is a whole group of kids who are brilliant that want to work with their hands, and we're not passing that information on to them. So we started this program. We are struggling greatly right now to get funding for the program, to get them in the factories and let them know. But that is one of our commitments in our education outlet right now. This is the national, because we're part of the national parks, we're part of the national park stamp program. And you can get a brochure from us and drive around and get your passport. And I'm amazed at how many people come from across the country just to get their passport stamped at our uh, automotive uh, museums. We also, uh, you know, history isn't always in books. And history is in that sometimes you have to tell the story where it happens. So we uh, apply for a grant. We do these wayside exhibits. 
We also uh, partnered up with the Etalon and Fort House to do one of those phone apps. So not only could you drive around your phone app and see the signs, we also have downloadable brochures on motorcities.org, our website. We have approximately 300 of these signs going in and the whole of uh, Southeast Michigan from Romeo going all the way out to Ypsilanti. <clears throat> now, one of the big things we do is Autopalooza. Now, here's another story. We have some of the best car events in the world in Michigan but these guys fight with each other. And they don't have any money to promote each other. So you've got, MIS has got all the money in the world it needs, and then you've got the, the Chevrolet uh, Belle Isle Grand Prix, which was struggling to get reestablished, re but thankful Roger Penske believed in it. And then we have the Woodward Dream Cruise, and then we have these other events. And what happens is they have zero budgets. They're almost all run with uh, volunteers. And they don't like to deal with each other because they think they're stealing their sponsorships. So we tricked them. The Detroit Convention Bureau and us, we got them all to go to MIS. We got them a free lunch. And we told them they were getting, going to see the X Prize a VIP, which we did. We get them a preliminary view of the X Prize. We got them all in the room. You should have seen them. Like this when they saw each other walking in, because they all know each other. So then we said, we're going to introduce a concept called Autopalooza. And what we want you to do is we want you to pull your resources and see if we can start advertising our events outside of Michigan, particularly in five states. Texas, we don't know why Texans like our car events, because if you do surveys, they show up. Rochester, New York keeps showing up in our surveys. We don't know why. We think there's some kind of you know, migration pattern. We know Ohio. We know Illinois. Windsor, and also uh, Indiana. So we pull it, the Detroit Convention Bureau does this broadcast of ads, and so what happens? Let's take the Concourse de Elegance. They had about 7,600 people going to it, they now have just under 11,000. The other thing is we started having them introduce educational components in it, so if you go to the back to the bricks in Flint, you will see that the kids from Kettering's get to build robot, uh, robots, and then they compete each other. Uh, last year they were shooting basketballs. I don't know what the, the, the task is this year's. And then at the uh, Woodward Dream Cruise, which never does anything educational, just as much loudness as they can, uh, we had uh, Lawrence Institute of Technology actually rebuild a Ford Shelby and put an electronic engine in it, and they got it running on site. And uh, so we are trying to get people more aware of not just the loud motors, the revving, and the burning of the tires. What we want to know is the artistry in the classic cars and also the technology in the classic cars. And that is the concept we're uh, doing. We are now trying to work with the, the Gratiot Cruises. We've got three Gratiot Cruises on Gratiot. They don't like each other. They don't want to have their events in the same thing, and yet, I know that when we get done, we will get all of these people working together, because you know why? We have a compelling story to tell, we have a great product to present, and we, all have, we don't have a lot of money. We need to come together and promote each other and help each other out. So what happens? Concourse needs a track, so MIS says, okay, you can come and use our track. MIS needs a, a, needs a Duesenberg, so the Concourse goes, we know somebody with a Duesenberg, and you get the Duesenberg. Are you following me what's happening now? with these events? Oh, my, they're best buddies. They got speed dial. They're going back and forth. Oh, I need this. Can you help me? Uh, and the events are better and more powerful and more visited than they ever were before. Now, we had a press conference today, and Michael Callahan, the vice president of the Convention Bureau, told us, do you know that there's over $100 million get invested in Michigan at these auto events? So for all of you that get mad because Woodward is total gridlock, during the Woodward Dream Cruise, I want you to think about that, about what it does to our economy. 26% of the people coming to these auto events are from out of state. That's money that's coming into our economy. And I think that we, are, we should just celebrate. It's our thing. It's our Mardi Gras. It's our specialness. It's what we do, and they say in the commercial. So let's do it, but let's do it better than anybody else. <clears throat> now, we're talking about from... Tinkers to Titans, and one of the ones I'm going to talk about is Henry Ford, because it's his 150th birthday, and he looks pretty good for 150. What do you think? And so what we did is we partnered with 31 organizations, and we created a website. And there's a bunch of watershed 
uh, milestones that are being celebrated from this year, 2013 to 2015, and we wanted to make the public aware of it. So we've got Henry's birthday, which is 150 this year, 2013. We have the 100th anniversary of the automated assembly line, which is said across the world, it was one of the biggest transformations of manufacturing that you could have. It happened in Highland Park. Now there was a TV special just this week called the 10 most significant buildings in the world and guess what? Highland Park was on it. It's in your backyard. It's in a deplorable state. There's a group of people trying to buy it. We want to help them. We want to applaud them. The Ford people are scared to death because they don't want to get drawn into it because of all the liability. But I think they want, they're cheering us on, but from the background, if you get my drift. It's going to be us, us citizens, that make it happen. Just like it was a bunch of private guys that bought the Paquette plant, just like it was a high school kid that had her, her wine and cheese party to save Nankin. It's going to be the community that saves it. It's not going to be a corporation. It's not going to be somebody with a big check. It's going to be all the little actions that come together. Now, one of the things we launched today um, in our thing was a driving tour. We partnered up with Windsor. It's the 100th anniversary of Ford City in Windsor. So we have this driving tour in Windsor. And did you guys ever go to Ford City and you see those beautiful murals they have there? Well, you're going to take one of these home and you're going to take a loved one with you. And if not, just take somebody with you and go over there. But don't eat before you go because they got some of the best Italian restaurants I've ever eaten at. And, and my mom's from Italy, so I'll tell you, I get spoiled with good Italian food. And um, go over to Windsor. And also you could go to the Jack Minor Bird Sanctuary, which was also sponsored by Henry Ford because he was an avid birder with Clara. The Life and Times in Henry is a driving tour in uh, all of Southeast Michigan, but what's so exciting about it is because we're part of the National Park Service, they allowed us to connect to the on-cell system. So what we did is we had all of our researchers come together and they actually did research, and we came out with this route of all these places and we came up with the stories. So you can drive from point one to point two and then you call the on-cell number and then you plug in the number and then there's, there, a guy will tell you the history of the site. And this is the first time we've ever done it, so I'm really excited about it. And we got somebody with a professional voice that donated his voice. He's a weatherman. I can't give away his identification. I'll let you try to guess. And uh, um, he's a radio um, personality, by the way. And um, it's just fun. And that's the whole pur purpose, is to have fun and to learn and to be inspired. Because what I want to ask you is, where in America can you go and see a place that actually launched the automated assembly line? Only in Detroit. Where in America can you go to see where the $5 day was launched that changed immigration across the world and we actually had more immigrants than New York City and Los Angeles? Where could you go? <gasps> Detroit. How is that possible? Where can you go when you see an industrialist actually built one of the first public hospitals Ford Health System. Where could you go in America to see that? <gasps> Detroit. And I think we forget the significance of the things that happen here. We, I totally do. The reason why this celebration is going from 2013 to 2015 is because these milestones are happening. The 100th anniversary assembly line, the 100th anniversary of the $5 day, the 100th uh, uh, anniversary of Fort City and Windsor, the 100th anniversary of the Ford Health System, and the 50th anniversary of the Ford Mustang. We couldn't forget the Mustang, now could we? And uh, so that's what we're going to do. And if we're going to go through these slides, here's our website. And this is what's cool. We made this website into an assembly line. So you go on the website and you click on that little arrow, and the next time, it's a timeline. And it'll show you a picture and it'll give you the time of what's going on. It's just fun. You got to do it, you know? Now, we had a school in California call us up. The teacher made this a class project. And they sent us a picture of all their posters. It was so cool. I had to send it to Ford Motor. You have to get Ford Motor, you know. And uh, the thing is, and we also got merchandise on there. And we have landing sheets for it. And we have the driving tours. There is also a bus tour that's being offered by Preservation Detroit in partnership with WA3, which is the Water Action Association. Here we go. Here's Ford City. Go ahead. 
And um, you can do a driving tour there and make sure you go to their wineries and make sure you go to their restaurants because they're very cool. Go ahead. And uh, here's a celebration of, uh, of the uh, 100th anniversary of the automated assembly line in Highland Park. Uh, here was a $5 date. Look at, look at 100,000 people showed up. Can you imagine making an announcement one day and 100,000 people show up the next day? Do you understand what that involved for those poor guys in the office? <laughs> Most people don't understand that this was one of the world's largest manufacturing facilities at a time. And, and what really amazed me when I go in there is that it had its own symphony because uh, Henry believed in music. So they actually had their own band. They had their own general store for their workers. They had a mini hospital, which is how Henry and Clara got interested in, in uh, social medicine. And um, they actually had a school in there so that the immigrants could learn how to speak English. It was an amazing, amazing social project as well as manufacturing. Okay. And then we've got the uh, Mustang coming on. And we've got next, <clears throat> we've got Clara actually built a nursing school, school for nurses, and also housing for the nurses, because back then, you know, girls had to live with their parents until they got married, but it's hard to go to school down in Detroit when your farm is way up in Pinckney. And so she built housing for them, which made it very popular. And then, now, where do we go from here? That's the question. Now, hopefully, I inspired you to think about that. So, uh, right now, in the celebration of Henry Ford, We've got a group of artists that are taking uh, F-150 fenders and they're making sculptures out of it. And then they're putting sculptures at all these sites so that you can go, because you know the, some of these buildings are gone and stuff, so you can see the sculpture and stuff. Now, it's so popular now, the airport asked if they could have some of our sculptures. So I'm gonna have a tour with no sculptures anymore because, and the Ford uh, headquarters wants some too. So you know what, you, you, you accommodate these guys so they'll write you checks later. So yeah, well, they're gonna get all the sculptures, but it's fun. And the teachers are teaching the kids how to make these sculptures, so that's fun. Here's the driving tours that I just told you about. Go ahead. And right now, uh, we got the uh, uh, Dearborn Historical Society uh, coming up with their own walking tour, biking tour, and their own driving tour. Go ahead. And so I wanted to leave you with this message. What is the legacy that we're gonna leave behind about our own significance. Are we gonna just give it like this? Are we gonna let the newspapers always talk about what's wrong in this area? Are we gonna remind our kids that greatness, the things that actually moved America forward, came out of here? Didn't happen in California. Didn't happen in Hollywood. Didn't happen in the Big Apple. I hope nobody's here from New York and California. It didn't. It happened here. So what I hope to instill in you is that we are a city of thinkers and tinkers that became titans. These were just the average Joe that came in here. There is a multitude of projects to get involved with. I'm sure many of you are involved with your own here in Troy. And I want you to be proud. I want you to be proud of what we did to move America forward what we did to help America save democracy in a world war, what we did to move man into space, what we continued to do to move man into robotics, into new forms of energy and high efficiency batteries. We have the largest green roof in the whole world at the Ford Rouge plant. I invite you to take your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors to see that Ford Rouge tour that just worked out of the Henry Ford. And most of all, I invite you to just learn about your own history. Thank you very much.